It's reaction time. Andy Elliott with questions that salesmen should always ask. Hi, I'm Kevin Hunter, the homework guy, and author of Is That the Best You Can Do? You have arrived at the home of super high intensity training for car buyers. Today, I'm joined by the amazing Elizabeth as we take a look at Andy Elliott's video, Questions to Always Ask on the Car Lot as a Car Salesman. This material we are reviewing is just over 30 days old, so it's hot off the press. I want to make something clear. Why does it make perfect sense that our show, the Homework Guy channel, would do reactions on sales training? Is it for the purpose of roasting somebody just to make them look bad? Nope. It's for learning purposes, to understand the opponent's playbook. Exactly. Think of buying a car as being a little like a football game. It's the goal of the other team to jam the ball in your end zone. Well, they're going to get four touchdowns when, one, they get the highest price for the car that they're selling you. That's the first score. The most amount of products and fees packed in in the finance office, that's the second score. They get you to take their financing, that's the third score, and then they lowball you on your trade. That's the fourth score. So on the flip side, you can score when you're able to buy your vehicle at the lowest reasonable price, the first touchdown. You refuse all the stuff finance wants to pack into your deal, the second touchdown. You have either cash or your own financing, the third score, and you get the best value for your trade, the fourth touchdown. I want to win 28 to nothing. That's the attitude. These score totals will determine who wins, who loses, or if it's a draw, like a 14-14 tie. Car buying is just two sides of the same coin. The salesman is about making themselves and the dealer win. And we're here to see that you win. That's right. So my friend, that's why we do video reactions. We want you to know what's in the opponent's playbook. Shoot, that should make sense even to a car salesman who stops by here frequently. All right, let's roll Andy Elliott's teachings on questions a car salesman must ask you, the car buyer. Hey guys, what's up? It's Andy. All right, so this video is going to be about questions to always ask on the car lot. All right, guys, so listen, here's what we're going to do. I want you to look at this. This clearly is a funnel. Notice the top. See how big the funnel is? It's wide open. That means they just got in the market. Down here, this is the bottom of the market. Okay, marker sucks. Check this out. So as we're at, at the bottom of the market down here, this customer is ready to buy. Like this second, they're ready to buy. Now these people will buy today, and this could be on the phone, or it could be in person. These people are ready to buy. This funnel that he just drew out. So let's take a look at the top. Who's on the top of this funnel here, Liz? People who haven't made any decisions, they just think they want to buy a car. So they're interacting with the salesman before having done things like done market study on their vehicle, they haven't talked to their own bank, they don't know what their trade is worth, they don't know what kind of rates they qualify for, they have done nothing. They're just wide open to any number of options. Where should a homework guy viewer be in this funnel that Andy's talking about? Homework guy viewers, you should be at the very bottom of the funnel, you did all your research, you're ready to put that football in the other end zone, you're ready to win. Right. But they just got in the market, which means they don't know exactly what they want yet, they think they know what they want, but they don't really know what they want. Let me give you an example. And you shouldn't be talking so to a salesman says he's looking if you're at the top Ford of the funnel. I'll well, ask him a simple question. i say, hey man, those are great trucks. Have you driven one yet? Based on, he said, no, I haven't driven one yet, but, I, but I've had one for a while and it's been a good truck. All right, stop. Did you hear that question? I said, awesome. Have you driven one yet? How many times do you guys go to show a car and you've never asked if they've driven one yet. Is there anything wrong with this question he's asking? It's a perfectly honest question. I mean, you should drive the car you're going to buy, right, Kevin? A exactly. The only difference between a salesman and questions that you would be asking because you're trying to get information uh, to serve your own causes is just remember that he's asking the question to serve a cause. And if they did drive one, I would say, cool, man, how'd it drive? So what'd you think of it? I want to hear what they have to say. Based on what people say will allow me to go where I want to go next. Ooh, he <laughs> wants to take the deal. He wants to be in charge of everything, and I'm not cool with that. That's correct. So what he just said there makes it really clear he wants that football in his hand, okay? And you always know who's winning the game based on who's holding the ball. I may even change up the way I'm going to respond based on the way that they answered that question. Now, down here, I ask a guy, hey, have you driven an F-150? He says, yeah. I say, great, man. How, how to drive? Because he great. did his I homework. Say, awesome, man. Have you driven a lot of them? Or did you just drive one? He said, well, I've driven five or six of them. Beautiful. Why well, haven't you purchased one yet? Think about it. Some of the biggest questions that you'll ask 
will allow you to get the answers that you need to guide the customer to the next place. Do you want to? Who's in control here right now when he's talking about getting answers uh, to guide the customer? Who's in control? That's the salesman right there. Yes, yeah, so you're, you shouldn't be taking lead from the salesman here at all. Who should be asking the questions if you've done all your homework? The customer needs to ask the questions because you should only have a few questions left before you're actually ready to do the deal. Right. Go into the same trap that the salesperson went into at the last dealership? No, but you could go there accidentally by not asking questions. So I asked the guy, I said, hey man, uh, you know, guy's like, hey man, I'm looking for an F-150. I'm like, beautiful, man, those are great trucks. Hey, have you had the chance to drive one of the newer F-150s yet that you're wanting to look at? No, I haven't. Okay, that guy's wide open. I might be able to sell that guy right now a Chevy, a Ford. Hell, I sell the guy a Toyota. I sell the guy anything. The guy. <laughs> I'll sell the guy anything, and that's exactly right. You're gonna get sold anything because you belong down at the bottom of the funnel. Though it's, what's what's important about this funnel is when are you interacting with a dealership or a salesman. So you have no business interacting with a dealer or a salesman when you're at the top of the funnel and you're completely clueless. When you're at the bottom of the funnel and you've zeroed in on the value of the car, what your trade is worth, your interest rates, how much cash you're putting in the deal, you got all those questions answered, that's when you should be talking to a salesman. But you recognize that, that Andy knows, and you'll probably say this, Andy knows that the tougher customer is the one that's on the bottom. That should be the homework guy viewer hasn't driven anything, which means he has an idea in his head that he would probably like to own a Ford. That guy is wide open and just got into the buying funnel. This guy is easy to close. There, he said it. Easy to close, clueless, and he's likely to get what? Hosed. Hosed, yes, very hosed. This guy down here, he's niched down to a certain car. He knows what he wants. And that is who? The homework guy buyers. That's right. But he hasn't purchased yet because of a reason. So what I do is I say, hey man, so yeah, no, Ford F-150s are great trucks, man. Hey, look, have you had the chance to drive one yet? No, I haven't. Okay, boom, wide open. Yes, I have. Beautiful, man. What'd you think about the way they drove? Well, they were nice. Cool, did you just drive one or have you driven a couple of them? Well, I've drove five or six. You know, this is actually really good salesmanship right here. These are questions that I used to ask all the time. You know, find out how prepared the customer actually is to make a deal. But do you know or you have any clue what I did with customers if I ran into them and they were very clearly in the top of the funnel? They hadn't done any of the things they should do so that they knew what a good deal looks like, like the guy at the bottom of the funnel. Any clue what I did with these people who are in the top of the funnel? Oh, I'd say you took them for a few test drives, gave them some information, you sent them home to think about it. Bingo. So that's something a car salesman will not do. I actually cared about the customer and I was about building relations, not a one-off transaction. And, and that's what Andy puts a little too much of his emphasis on is really that one-off transaction. So he's about getting you in the door and sold today and not necessarily helping you make the right steps for you. But again, this goes back to the football game. He's trying to shove the football into your end zone. You need to be the guy at the bottom of the funnel and be putting the ball into their end zone. Man, so you love the way they drive. By the way, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm gonna serve you in the, in the highest level and I'm gonna give you world-class customer service. <laughs> but so you want an F-150, obviously you've driven a couple of them. You love the way they drive. Let me ask you a question. Why haven't you purchased one yet? Great question. Yeah. Why haven't you purchased one yet? So if you're at the bottom of the funnel, nothing wrong with answering this question. You should be very specific on what you're looking for. So when, when we say that you're the one who should be asking the questions, you should be having all those details out and say, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And this is the reason I haven't made the purchase. Now, Andy's got an opportunity to meet those requirements you put on a piece of paper, but when I sent customers home, like Liz was saying, I was having them doing all the homework so that they came to the bottom of the funnel. Then they came back and we made alignment between what we had in products, et cetera, and the homework they'd done. So when it came down to, is this a good deal or not? What did they know about that deal I was putting on the table? Well, they knew and understand all the numbers and they knew it was actually a good deal. They knew everything was fair and that it was well calculated. There you go. So the problem is, is I didn't have to ever sell anybody. They sold themselves. 
because they'd done their homework and they recognized the good car deal when they looked at it. That's the difference between somebody that's being led by a salesperson and a good salesperson who actually helps you do your homework. You come out the back end of that knowing what a good car deal looks like. And hey, that's a win-win thing. I had customers buying me gift cards and donuts and all kinds of things all the time. And I never once told them that they should like me or love me or care about me, which you hear salespeople say all the time. Never once did that. And yet I had car buyers give me a hug all the time when they left the car lot. That question could be the question that no other salespeople out there had the courage to ask. Or I would say there's a difference between being prepared and truly being prepared. They didn't even know how to ask that question. You were able to surface an answer that was the key to the entire car deal. You know what he says? Well, they didn't give me enough for my trade. I didn't like the salesman. So all the automatically, I said, hey man, well, number one, I just want to tell you, Ford F-150s are a great truck. You're going to love the truck that I've got. You're going to love it. I'm positive of it. How many of our viewers don't like the salesman? They're talking to <laughs> uh, Most of them. Yes. And secondly, I just want to remind you that I'm not that guy. I understand that sometimes buying a car can be a little bit difficult. It doesn't have to be that way here, and it's not going to be that with that way with us. In the end, you're going to love me so much, you're going to want to adopt me. I promise you, I'm going to take great care of you. I'm going to say, every car you buy for the rest of your life, sir, I'm going to earn your business. Thank you for being here. Boom. Now There goes right to the point of what I made earlier. If you have to tell the customer, you're going to love me, you're going to want to adopt me, you're going to all this kind of stuff, you have to put those thoughts into their head. Well, you haven't earned their business and you certainly haven't earned their love and respect, which when somebody, when you treat somebody honestly, fairly, transparently from beginning to end, they really, really respect you and they like you a lot because it's so rare in the business. How do I know that I have to make this guy L-O-V-E love me? Because he didn't buy because of the salesperson. Also, it could be the guy says, hey, the trade-in wasn't high enough. Now I need to think about this right out the gate. I'm gonna get into numbers with this guy down the road. So going into the trade, going into the worksheet, I know that this guy's sensitive on his trade. And I won't ask him, well, hey, man, what Good thing you to be aware for? of. You could ask that to gather the information, but my goal is to play the exact opposite. It was to, to set myself up and be more prepared than the salesman at the other store. And what would that look like? I would say, okay, guys, so look, so obviously you love the F-150. I'm going to get some numbers from my manager. Now, look, you told me earlier the reason why you hadn't purchased yet is because people haven't given you enough money for your trade-in. Look, I'd like to ask you a couple questions so I can fully understand and make sure that we don't have that problem here, okay? We're high in all the critical areas that are important to you and your family. We'll always be the best on numbers. I got two questions. Number one, my general manager gives top dollar for vehicles that have been serviced the best. Would you mind sharing everything that you've done on your vehicle within the last... So he just said that the general manager gives top dollar for vehicles that have been serviced the best. What's the likelihood that that statement is true? It's... It's just a lie. I mean, everyone gives a lowball number at all dealerships, so it's just a way to convince you to trust him. So we'll, we'll see what he does with this information because logically, if you had done a fantastic job of taking care of your car and invested all kinds of money into it to make it better, new tires, et cetera, all that kind of thing, all of that should be driving the value of the vehicle up. Let's see what Andy does with this information. Two years so I can share it with them. And that way we can make sure we get full credit for everything you've done to it. And you're Bingo. gonna start writing it down. Okay, cool. So you did the tires, awesome. How much did those cost? $2,000. What else did you do? All right, you did the AC. How much did that cost? $2,000. And I start going down and I start adding this stuff up and listen, here's the idea of it. What if it's on the other end? By the way, I'm gonna show you how to use this to leverage it. But what if it's on the other end and the guy says, hey man. He used the word leverage. Make sure you see our video on leverage because the leverage should be yours, not theirs. You know what? I haven't spent any money on the last two years. I say, cool, man. So you owned it for two years and you're saying you spent no money because it's such a great car, right? And guess what I do at that point? I'm gonna fish for some things that need to be done to it now. So I'll say, hey, listen, so here's the deal. My service manager, his job is to make these vehicles like new for the next customers that are gonna own them. I have a question, I wanna ask you something, all right? We sold the car to a lady about a month ago. She was driving down the road. The windshield wipers quit working on her when it was raining. When it went through the service inspection, the windshield wipers were working but the customer knew that sometimes they would stop working, but they were working when the technician checked it out. How would we know, right? Let me ask you a question. So we could ensure that that never happened again, 
My service manager has asked me, would you mind sharing? Well, Andy's got a great narrative. It's a great story, but it's not actually true. The service managers and the salespeople, they rarely talk to each other. Um, they don't need to. And they don't care. They're yeah. not going to feed lines to the salespeople about what you should say to people about their cars and no. what we care about the maintenance level they've done on the car. They don't care. If this car was going to be sold to your sister or you were to come buy it yourself, nobody knows your car better than you. Would you mind sharing everything that needs to be done to it to get it ready for the next owner? What would that be? And I painted a picture. I told a story. Yeah, he painted a picture and told a story. That's exactly what it was. And now I'm asking the questions. He said, well, I would definitely say you need to do the tires. I'd say, okay, cool, tires. And what else? Well, I would do the windshield. Okay, and then I would fix that bumper. Awesome. So tires, windshield, and bumper, if you were to sell it to someone else, beautiful. Now listen, I am not battling and getting stuck on the trade-in game and giving him a number yet. What I'm doing is that I'm setting up the cell. The cell can't be closed until it's open. And how do you open it? You open it by asking great questions. You know, I see so many salespeople that don't know how to present and then how to defend. And when I go to present this guy's trade, and by the way, this all came about by me asking a question when they got into the dealership. So the present and defend, think of the present as being them shoving the football in your end zone, and the defend is preventing you from accomplishing your goals. So that's what he's doing here. Go back and rewatch this video and you'll see how we got here. I asked questions early on that allowed me to set up the cell where I want it to go later on. Remember to remember to hear everything that your customers say. Your customers won't tell you everything. You need to ask specific design questions to get the information that you need to know to take the cell where you want it to go. Ouch. So that <laughs> means uh, he's just telling you he's in control. <laughs> yes, he's got the ball. And if it doesn't go there, it's because you didn't set it up to go there. If you're training with me, you'll always learn how to set up the cell properly. Now, as I've taught you in this video about questions, watch when I go to present the pencil. I say, hey, sir, great news. Boom. Eight. So where do you think he's going to go with this? He collected some information in one scenario where the person said, I put tires on, I did all this work to it. And then the other scenario is where the person did absolutely nothing to it. So logically, you would think that the person who put this money into their vehicle, the dealer is going to give them the highest dollar possible. The, the other side where the person did absolutely nothing, well, they're like, holy cats, we have to do everything, a tune up the whole nine yards. So where do you see the evaluation coming on the trade on this one? What do you think the dealer is going to do with it? I don't think they're going to give them any extra money. They never do, Kevin. Let's see what happens. 15 grand for your trade, sign here. You love the F-150, let's get it wrapped up, put it in your driveway, sign here. Guy says, hey man, I told you, just like down the road, they weren't getting enough for my trade. I said, hey, I totally understand. Look, what we did is that we did some research and remember a minute ago, you told me you hadn't spent any money on your car in the last two years. What well, we know since you hadn't spent any money, there's 15,000 pieces working on a machine. If you haven't done anything in two years, you think those machine pieces are getting wore down and gonna need to be replaced and things are gonna need to get fixed? Yes. Logically, they're getting Those worn out. Those are things that we're going to have to fix when we go to service it. You see how I turn that back? Or let's say he says, Andy, I need more for my trade. I say, hey, I totally understand. Look, sir, I know that you want $18,000 or we're giving you 18000 You said you want a little more for it. Look, remember how you spent 2000 on the tires, 2000 on the AC? Look, the fact is, is that the longer you keep your car, it gives it time for more opportunity for something else to go wrong for you to even spend more money on your car. Uh, okay, so that's what he did with the information. He's just telling you, yeah, look at this. You, you got this money pit of a vehicle. You keep putting money into it. So the money that you said you put into it, thinking that you would get a better evaluation on your trade had no effect on the trade evaluation at all. So the fact that we're giving you the 18 grand right now, you're getting top dollar for your trade. And also on top of that, if you were to drive out of here and keep it a little bit longer, let's say even another day longer, it gives it time for something else to break for you to even spend more money out of your pocket, just like you did here. If it's even a day longer, like there's just looming disaster. You're getting really close to when your truck explodes. And uh, yeah, you better get rid of this. That's why I said even a day longer because they wanted this sale closed today. Today. Do you see what I'm saying? My argument, right, is not arguing that his car is not worth it. I'm actually using money justification to justify why trading it right now and getting this money 
is actually top dollar for the vehicle and I gathered information early on to bring into it. Now, this isn't about presenting the trade-in objection. Don't get it confused. I'm just talking to you about how asking questions early on will allow you to apply it later on towards your negotiation. He pretty much admitted right there that the collection of the information about the trade really didn't have anything to do with where the trade evaluation was going to come it in. It just put the customer into a mindset of, oh, I didn't take care of my car. I should expect to not get more money for it. That's all. And on the other side of that was, oh, you're putting all this money into it. Look how much more you could be putting into it. You better trade it out quick. You're closing or directing the customer towards the right car. This funnel, never forget it. When you meet a customer. He's exactly right. Never forget the funnel. And why? Because you want to make sure that you're at the bottom of homework guy buyers, that you know exactly what you need and that you're going to win this game. At the time you're interacting with the salesman, yes. you have to be at the bottom. So when you're starting your car shopping, it should be away from salespeople, away from the dealership. You should be collecting all of that information so that you're moving down the funnel and you end up at the bottom. And that's when you start interacting with the dealer or a car salesman, not before. You have no business being on a car lot when you're at the top of the funnel and then you're allowing somebody like Andy Elliott to tell you what the next steps are. Bad place to be. They're either wide open, they just got in, or they're niched down and they're ready to buy, but there's a reason why they haven't bought yet. Right where you want to be. You have to be able to ask them the question. My goal is to teach you all the skill that I know. I have tons of courses. I do live master closer seminars every single month. My YouTube videos are like baby food. They're just training that I give they you. Taste bad? <laughs> that's, yeah, do they taste mm, bad? Spinach. No, that's to this point, you guys, everything that you're seeing him share, you think this stuff is bad. He just said it's the baby food. You go to the actual classes, like both of us have sat through actual salesman training in a dealership. Wow, the things they say there when there's no customers, no viewers watching, it is absolutely mind blowing. So yes, this is baby food. This is just the surface of it. Really pay attention to this stuff though, because there's a lot you can learn from it. Anything else, uh, Liz, that you want to say about uh, Andy Elliott's video? And even the analogy of scoring the touchdowns, anything you want to add to that? Um, just remember that if you're in control, you're going to do much better. So if you don't think you have all your questions answered, you don't have a piece of paper where you wrote everything down and you're keeping track of your information, expect to get guided by a salesperson. Exactly right. You got to be prepared and you want to be that car buyer that's down at the bottom of the funnel who's very niched because you know what you qualify for financing wise, you know what your trade is worth, you know what the vehicle's worth that you're trying to buy. You have all your questions answered. You got a few things that you need to tidy up and that's why you're now at the dealership, but you wanna be that person who's at the bottom of the funnel. If you appreciate this opponent's playbook review today, consider giving us a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Include hashtag the homework guy and look for us on any of your favorite social media platforms out there. There's a list here on the screen and down in the description box below. If you love what we do and want to contribute with a tip, well, the PayPal and Cash App links that you see here will be easy to find in the description box or on a website. But no problem if you can't do a tip. Another way to say thank you is to help us get the word out. Yes, you want your friends and family to be lucky just like you, right? Put this video up so others can see it too and encourage them to subscribe. Smack that notification bell too so you don't miss a thing. We're here to represent the car buyer and that's exactly what we do. Thanks everyone for coming back. We'll see you on our next video. You guys rock. I'm Kevin Hunter here with the amazing Elizabeth. We, we gotta, gotta go. go.